Good morning. Welcome to Bethany United Methodist Church, where we are leading others to experience God's love, know Jesus Christ, and grow in his image. Today, Sunday's back, and there are several... Yeah. <laughs> This is wonderful. For those of you who are at home, we are having people in person in worship now on uh, both the 9.30 and the 11 o'clock services, so we're really excited about that. I'm Pastor Wynn. I'll be assisting Pastor Tom in this service. We have several ways that you can be connected. Here in person is a great way to begin. In person at home for worship also is wonderful, and we encourage all of you to check in, register your attendance with us today, share any contact information updates that we need to have to keep our records up to date. We also encourage you to connect by sharing your prayer requests. You can do that on our website. Go to that uh, prayer link there. You can also find a number on that page where you can call and talk to a prayer minister right now. He or she is happy to assist you in that conversation with God. For all the ways that you feel led by the Holy Spirit to give of your financial gifts, you can go to our giving link to do that online as well. We encourage you to visit our Stay Connected page to see what ministries are up and running, ways that you can share the gifts that God has given to you to share in this world. And of course, Thanksgiving is coming up really quick, so click on that link about Thanksgiving meals. We can still uh, have uh, bags to give out, either a red bag or a cream-colored bag you can pick up on our campus. They're just outside the entryway of the, um, the Bethany school door, or if you're here in person, they're probably out in the gathering area of our worship center. There are lists and instructions on the bags themselves, but also on our website if you need that. These bags can be filled and then dropped off by Sunday, November the 15th. You can drop the bags off in the worship center at an in-person worship service. You can drop the bags off at an outdoor worship service on Sunday evening or at the Ark on Wednesdays, 4 to 6 p.m. And I know I just gave you a lot of information. That's all available online. You can also contact Maggie Todd or Chris Cutler to make arrangements if you can't come at any of those times. One final announcement that I want to give to y'all here and also at home is that we do have a drive-in worship service tonight, and that starts at 6.30, so we hope that you join us outside as we continue with our worship opportunities. We're going to begin our worship now, so I invite you to give each other a wave, give a shout-out on Facebook in the comment post to pass the peace of Christ. Let us stand and sing. So this November 11th is Veterans Day, so in recognition, let us, uh, let us begin with America. Continue our worship. Power, it burns like 
with you we are victorious you are stronger than our hearts you are greater than the dark with you we are
songs of praises I will never give to thee Songs of praises I will never give to thee As we continue our worship time today, I invite you to join me in a responsive prayer that is a collective prayer for us of confession and intercession. As we pray, I invite you to name silently in your, in your minds and in your hearts the things that you need to confess and the things about which you want to pray. The words will be on the screen and the response will be indicated for you in bold. Let us pray. God of mercy, God of peace, God of grace, this has been a hard week in the midst of a hard year, and we need you. We thank you that when we can come before you as brothers and sisters today and offer our prayers to you and know that you hear us, we believe that you see us you love us and you are with us. We trust that your spirit is interceding for us even as we pray. God, this week we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed in how we have treated one another. God of mercy, hear us and forgive us. We have been blind to our own prejudice arrogance and hypocrisy we have failed to see and honor the image of God in one another God of mercy hear us and forgive us we have failed to love as Jesus loves we have been impatient unkind irritable resentful and insistent on our own way God of mercy hear us and forgive us. We grieve the division in our families, our communities, our nation. We long for people to come together in the love of Jesus. We pray for all our leaders. God of peace, hear us and help us. We are afraid and anxious about the days, weeks, and months to come. We're weary of the political rhetoric that pits us against one another. We are worried about the pandemic and its impact on our lives and our world. We struggle to talk with one another instead of at one another. We struggle to find common ground. God of peace, hear us and help us. We pray for wisdom humility and courage to see with your eyes, to hear with your ears, and to love with your heart. We pray for willing hearts to do our part in working toward unity, standing for justice, and loving the least, the last, and the lost. God of peace, hear us and help us. We pray for healing of bodies and spirits, 
hearts and minds. We pray for healing of relationships and the healing of our nation. We pray for the healers who are instruments in your hands. God of grace, hear us and sustain us. We have experienced many losses this year, personally and communally. In all of these, we pray both for comfort and that we would be gentle comforters for one another. God of grace, hear us and sustain us. We pray that your spirit would cover us and fill us, reminding us that our primary identity is as your beloved children. Restore us and renew us in hope as we wait patiently for your kingdom to come, even while we walk in faith that it already is. God of grace, hear us and sustain us. God of mercy, God of peace, God of grace. We may be uncertain about the future, but we put our confidence in you. Hear these prayers and the ones we have not named as we pray together the prayer that Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. My brothers and sisters, I want to welcome you again. Those of you, uh, those of you who joined us a little bit late, we are glad you were here with us at Bethany where we are leading others to experience God's love, know Jesus Christ, and grow in his image. I'm Pastor Wynn, and we have a lot of ways that we want you to connect with us. First, uh, register your attendance. Check in, click on that link so that we can see that you are here with us and keep track of all of our Bethany folks. We also encourage you to uh, be in prayer with us. You can share those on our website. Site. You can call a prayer minister at the phone number that is on our prayer page online. We encourage you to consider how the Spirit is leading you to share your financial gifts, and you can click on a giving link in order to do that. And we encourage you to visit our Stay Connected page so that we can uh, share with you what ministries we have going on, like our Thanksgiving bags that we have. We want to make sure that you're aware of those. You can pick those up on campus. Uh, if you're here for in-person worship, if you stop by during the week, you can grab those out outside the Bethany School entrance of the Galilee building. There are instructions on the bags. There are instructions on our website about how you can drop those off either in person during a worship service or uh, on Wednesday evening by the ARC. I think it's 4 to 6 p.m. And you can also reach out to Maggie or Chris in student ministries in order to uh, figure out how to do that. We welcome you participating with us as we feed our community for these Thanksgiving meals. As we move on to our celebration during our offering time, today we are celebrating that Sunday's back, and many of you are back with us today. We are excited about this opportunity to bring back both 9.30 and 11 o'clock worship in person each week, along with safe, on-campus Sunday school options for children, for students, and for adults we're especially thankful for all of our volunteers, all of the people who are making Sunday mornings possible. And that includes our ushers and our greeters. If you're here, you see them today. Our sound and media team that keep us up and running, our musicians that lead us in worship, as well as our children and student ministry volunteers. We celebrate how God is using the body of Christ at Bethany to serve and make it possible for us to gather together in person safely so we can worship and grow together. I invite you to be in prayer now as you consider what you are to offer to God. This was certainly uh, an interesting Sunday to, to follow up in worship, but... Um, a very uh, purposeful time in worship. And if you look and, and hear the, the songs that we sing, um, they, are, they are glorifying our Lord, and, and that is who, who leads us. Uh, this next tune is uh, such a beautiful tune and just reassures us where our satisfaction needs to be, not in the world, not in politics, 
but our satisfaction needs to be in our Lord, Jesus Christ. This is called satisfaction.
You may be seated. And for the kids who are here, in particular kids of all ages, pay attention to the screen. For kids who are at home, you, uh, parents, if you're listening, you might want to have them come in. We're going to have our children's message. And we're starting our theme of, you have heard it said. One thing that if you've been in the church for a while, you have heard it said is that you will love your enemies. And Jody Marfell is bringing our children's ministries message to us today with just such a time, a uh, message as this for such a time as this. Enjoy. Good morning, Bethany family. Jody Marfell here, Director of Children's Ministries. I want to thank everyone that joined us at our Trunk or Treat event two weeks ago, for all the kids that came dressed up, and a special thank you to all those that came with a trunk and passed out candy. Also exciting news is that we sold out of all of our pumpkins at the Bethany Pumpkin Patch before Halloween. My family had a great time picking out pumpkins. My boys were so excited that we carved our pumpkins the week before Halloween. And for those of us that live in Texas, we know what happens if you carve your pumpkins too early. We had rot and stinky pumpkins. They were awful. Can you think about a time in your life when something smelled awful? Maybe you smelled some sour milk, an old stinky shoe. Have you ever smelled a skunk before that has sprayed? Or maybe it's the year 2020. We've all smelled something awful before. And for me to tackle the smell, of our rotten, stinky pumpkin, I put out a new air freshener. Not only to take away the smell of the pumpkin, but to also add a good, pleasant smell to our house. And this reminds me of what Jesus teaches us in the Bible. You know, the world we live in can be a really stinky place sometimes. And we're called as Christians, as God's children, to make it a sweeter and fresher place, just like the air freshener, by choosing to love others, especially those that we don't get along with. Maybe those that rub us the wrong way, think differently than us, those we don't understand, and maybe even those that we would consider enemies. Jesus says, if we only love people, love those that love us, then we're no different than anyone else. However, when we love everyone, including our enemies and those we don't understand or agree with, that we're loving the way that Jesus has taught us to love. This week, when life gets stinky, I encourage you to be an air freshener, to make it a little sweeter, fresher, maybe a little bit of heaven on earth for those around you. Please join me in prayer. Repeat after me. Dear Lord, life can get stinky. Help us to be air fresheners to those around us. When others look at us, may they see you and experience your love. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you, Jody. Already smells better in here, doesn't it? Yeah, nice. So uh, we're going to be talking a little bit uh, as we move into this. Uh, before I get into the sermon, I want to talk a little bit about the Bethany News. We, we changed the format early in the pandemic, and a number of you have noticed that as it's come across. And some of you have had some uh, challenges getting information out of it. So I'm going to just kind of point out a couple of things to you. One, it's going to come to you as an email looking something like this. And because it's in an email format, the page that comes to you is going to be pretty simple 
But on this page, there are going to be links that will take you to the fuller articles and more information. So if you look at this page under the Worship Plus 3, uh, you can see down there at the bottom, uh, there's a line that says, our full list of New Bethany Saints is here. And, and I don't know, somebody circled the here for me. I'm not sure who did that. Maybe Gail. Uh, but if you click on that here, it takes you to this page where it lists all the names uh, of the saints whose names we read in worship the other week. So each week you're going to have this coming to you. Uh, and under Care and Community, there's going to be a, a Celebrations and Concerns section. Uh, some of you missed that and missed finding it. But if you'll notice, it's always going to be here. And again, if you click on that link, it will take you to this page where it will have deaths and ongoing prayers. So I uh, want you to be aware of that as you're um, engaging with this new way of, of doing our communication. Uh, I think as you uh, get a little used to it, you'll find that all the information is there. It just doesn't look like what we're used to. So I encourage you to play a little bit with that and explore it a bit uh, and uh, engage with that. And I think you'll find all the information is actually on the page that you're seeking. Uh, if you're just joining us now online for worship, we're uh, glad you've come to worship with us this morning. I uh, want to welcome you to Bethany United Methodist Church where we are leading people to experience God's love, to know Jesus Christ, to grow in his image. For those of you in the room this morning, it is so nice to see you. Yeah. You know, it's so much nicer to actually have people out here to look at than just iPads. I'm just, I'm just saying. Nothing against iPads. I'm just saying. So I just want to get that out to you. Uh, we're talking this morning, you've heard it said, about enemies. And, and one of the things I, I, I notice uh, when we talk about this a lot of times is, is people um, sometimes make certain assumptions about what the Scripture teaches. And, and I'll, I'll hear things like, well, you know, the Bible says we don't have any enemies uh, you know, and, or, you know, we're not supposed to have any, 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 any enemies, you know, comments like that. So I, I want to I play a little bit with what actually is in Scripture. Uh, first, I want to give you a few uh, definitions uh, just as we get into this. This is from Merriam-Webster. You know, an enemy, one that's antagonistic to another, especially one seeking to injure, overthrow, or confound an opponent. Something harmful or deadly, i.e. alcohol was his greatest enemy, military adversary, a hostile unit or force. But now the, the definition of adversary is one that contends with, opposes, or resists. And then they give us a synonym, a synonym an enemy or opponent. But I, I want to pose to you this morning, there's, there's a little difference of understanding when we talk about enemy and adversary. The enemy uh, has more of a, a, a connotation uh, that comes to us of someone who actually means to do bad things or means to do harm with us. An adversary is, is, can be that, but most of the time it's just someone that opposes us or have a different point of view. But an enemy goes beyond that. And uh, that's going to be a, a distinction I'm going to talk about a little bit more as we move into this. But I want you to understand that there's a difference there. And right now in our culture, um, I, I don't think we're very good at keeping those separate. Having said that, if you think uh, the Bible says we're not supposed to have enemies, the Bible actually assumes we have enemies. Um, enemies, singular, 170 Old Testament references, nine New Testament references, plural, 233 Old Testament references, 23 New Testament references. Bible Gateway is wonderful. Uh, but, but, you know, I mean, the, the Bible actually assumes that you're going to have enemies. The Bible assumes that. The teaching of Scripture is not that you shouldn't have them. The teaching is you're going to have them. They're out there. The teaching is how do we respond to that and how do we address that and deal with that. Uh, let's be in prayer for a moment. Father, we come to you at the end of a crazy week. And uh, unfortunately, the craziness isn't over. Uh, and so we're in the midst of this. And uh, we, we just ask you to come and bring your spirit of peace to be in the midst of us this morning that we might be open to what you say to us. Uh, let the words of my mouth, the meditation of all of our hearts, be acceptable in your sight. You are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. So, so you know, understanding that that's there and that's a reality, uh, if we go to what is probably considered the prime teaching of Jesus in Matthew in the fifth chapter, uh, he begins with this comment. You've heard it said, you've heard that it was said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. Now, He's referring back to Old Testament. And I keep trying to remind people, you know, when you're reading the New Testament, you need to understand the Old Testament connections to that. If you don't have an Oxford annotated Bible, 
I, I really encourage you to find one or buy one because at the bottom of the page, it will give you all those connections back to the other scriptures. It's really a helpful piece of study. You've heard it said. So if you, if you track that back and look at it, you find in Deuteronomy, uh, this show no pity, life for life, eye for eye, tooth for tooth, hand for hand, foot for foot. Uh, Leviticus, anyone who maims another shall suffer the same injury in return, and then it lists those. Uh, in Exodus, if any harm follows, then you shall give life for life, eye for eye, tooth for tooth, hand for hand, foot for foot. And, and you hear that, that teaching, and Jesus is reaching back there, and he's pulling that forward. Now, that sounds rough. Uh, that Old Testament teaching sounds rough. Um, what you need to hear is that in the day when, G when God gave this to his people, this was a restraint. This was a restraint. In other words, God is teaching them, listen, this is, this is what's fair. Uh, it, it's not okay if, if somebody causes you an injury to cause something even worse to them. And it's not okay if they injure you to take their lives. I mean, he's, he's actually giving this to his people as a restraint on their behavior. And it's important for us to hear that because in our modern day when we read this, it sounds tough and difficult and mean. And what you ne really need to hear is that in its context, it was a word of compassion. doesn't sound that way, but it, but it was for its context. And now Jesus, much, much later, is going to take that passage and he's going to use that to launch into his own teaching as he fulfills the word. You've heard that it was said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I say to you, but I say to you. Now, now I want you to remember as we go through this, that Jesus cares an authority to speak into scripture that, that you and I don't have the freedom to use. Because Jesus, what, is, what does John say? In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And, and the Word became flesh and dwelt in the midst of us. Jesus is the Word personified, incarnate. So he carries an authority to speak into this that you and I do not necessarily have or hope to have. But he carries this authority of fulfilling the Word. So I say to you, but I say to you, do not resist an evildoer. If anyone strikes you on the right cheek, Turn the other also. If anyone wants to sue you and take your coat, give your cloak as well. If anyone forces you to go one mile, go also the second mile. Give to everyone who begs from you. Do not refuse anyone who wants to borrow from you. This is a pouring out of generosity. You've heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and, and hate your enemy. But I say to you, Love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you so that you may be children of your Father in heaven. For he makes his sun rise on the evil and on the good and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. For if you love those who love you, what reward do you have? Do not even the tax collectors do the same? And if you greet only your brothers and sisters, what more are you doing than others? Do not even the Gentiles do the same? Be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. Man, I hate it when he teaches like that. You know, I want you to, to love and pray for your enemies and, 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 and do good things for them. Uh, and, and, you know, let's be honest. Most of the time when, when people say, oh, we should pray for our enemies, we're not really praying good things for them, are we? Let's be honest. Oh, Lord, I wish they dropped dead, right? You've prayed that. You know it. Oh, oh, Lord, I wish, Bob. I mean, you know, but, but that's not what Jesus, he, he's saying, pray for them in, in love. Be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. So now I want you to think a minute about what it means to love as Jesus loves and to incarnate that. What's that Romans passage we use all the time as, as a word of assurance at the right time while we were still sinners? And in some uh, translations, it says at right time while we were still the enemies of God. Christ died for us. That, that's what this passage is talking about. You know, love and pray for them. Because this is the way God loves us. And this is the way God calls us to love those who oppose us or who are even our enemies. Love them. Pour yourself out for them. Now, there's not necessarily an expectation in doing so that you're going to become best buds right? I mean, he doesn't say that here. He doesn't say, oh, don't have any enemies. He, he says, these are your enemies. 
but he's talking about how, how we relate with them. You know, the, the eye for an eye thing works uh, really good when we talk about just adversaries. You know, the kind of thing, that, well, we disagree, and so we're going to treat each other with respect. Uh, but when you get to enemies, you know, that begins to break down. And these days, the, the line between adversary and enemy gets blurred so often. We, we talk about, you know, people disagreeing, but, but too often in our conversations, you know, when people disagree, all of a sudden we, we, we begin to demonize them. Because when we do that, then it makes it okay for us to treat them as less than. So we begin to say, no, they don't just, just disagree with me. You know, they, when they, just, they hate me. They want me to die. They want, they're going to ruin the country, recently, in the language we've heard. But we hear all these phrases that get tacked onto there, not to recognize that there can be uh, differing points of view, but rather to make the other person less than. And every time I'm listening to that rhetoric, <laughs> I'm reminded of, you know, when my kids were growing up, and they'd want to do this, that, or the other, and I would say, oh, no, 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 we're not going to do that. And they would respond with something like, you, you hate me. You're, you just want to ruin my life. Right? And I think, you know, we've kind of taken the whole level of discussion in our country and gone to that adolescent place. And we're called to be more adult about it and recognize that. But we're also called to go beyond that. To love and, and pray good things. Pray good things for those who are our adversaries and, and even more for those who are our enemies. And I want you to hear that last line. Be perfect, therefore, as your Father is perfect. You need to hold on to that. Because frankly, you and I, you and I, are going to struggle to do that. We're going to have a hard time. I'm sorry. It's just who we are. This is the reality of who we are. And, and, and if we can't pull that love of God, hold on to that and allow that to fill us and move through us, we're probably not going to love our enemies. This, this requires more than what most of us are able to do. And so we, we call this in. We say, okay, God, come on. Come on. And the amazing thing is if we, if we kind of get past ourselves and our own emotional reactivity in that moment and allow God to have his way with us, amazing things can begin to happen. Amazing things can begin to happen in our lives and in the lives of those around us. You know, the, the culture is not going to help you with this, right? I mean, the culture is going to work against you. Um, I read this earlier in the summer. This is Maureen Dowd uh, writing a commentary in the New York Times from May 30th. And she reported that, uh, you know, the Wall Street Journal had a chilling report a few days ago that Facebook's own research in 2018 revealed that, quote, our algorithms exploit the human brain's attraction to divisiveness. If left unchecked, Facebook would, quote, feed users more and more divisive content in an effort to gain user attention and increase time on the platform. And incidentally, there is a, a special on Netflix called The Social Dilemma. If you've not watched it, uh, you'll find it quite enlightening uh, reflecting this. So this came out in May 30th, and then in June, a month later, the Pew Research Center published a thing that said, you know, when, you, when we talk about people thinking about the state of our country, 12% uh, of them are happy with it. 12% are happy with the state of our country. 12%. That's all. 71% are angry. 66% are fearful. And coming into any kind of discussion with that baggage, no wonder we struggle so much with it. So for we who are followers of Jesus Christ, you know, in the midst of this uh, political season and, and all the kind of stuff we're in, you know, one of the things I keep saying, but I really want you to hear it this morning very carefully, is, is this. You know, the president's elected every four years, only four years at a time. And at the end of those four years, if we're unhappy, we, we vote them out. I mean, we, we have, every four years, we have a, a do-over on this thing. But, but Jesus is Lord forever. Amen. So, so hold to your faith, my friends. Hold on to that. Now, now let, me, let me give you a little, couple of little words uh, this, this morning. Uh, world War II was probably the largest mobilization uh, worldwide in a war that ever took place. 
and, and some of the tr most tremendous destruction that took place. And, and as the war was winding down, uh, the streets of Berlin looked like this. Uh, the, the once bustling capital of Germany uh, basically was reduced to rubble by the bombing campaigns that had gone on. L parts of London looked very much the same. Uh, other cities also, but this is Berlin I'm showing you a picture of. Uh, it, it, it was shattered. And, and the once great city of Hiroshima, or Hiroshima in Japan, was flattened and incinerated. And, and in the aftermath of that, in the aftermath of that, as the war wound down, our Secretary of State at the time, George Marshall, got together with some members of Congress and they began to craft what would become the Marshall Plan. Marshall was concerned that if we did nothing to help the countries in Europe that had been so heavily damaged, that they would be easy prey and Russia would just take over. And so his thought was, we need to reach out to them at this time and establish a relationship with them. And so with the help of members of Congress, they crafted a plan that provided the, the equivalent in modern day dollars of $130 billion of aid to rebuild Europe. Now, now later there was going to be another plan that would be uh, put together to help Japan rebuild. And, and over the period of time, those two would kind of become pushed together uh, under that title, the Marshall Plan. And, and in that, they would rebuild the economies uh, of Europe and they would rebuild the economy of Japan. Now I want you to know, this was, this was not received with great joy in the United States. Because remember, for a period of a number of years, people in the United States had sacrificed in this war effort in ways that sometimes we don't really understand. You know, their, their families had been torn apart. They had fathers and uncles and cousins and sons who had gone and died. They had sacrificed economically for a period of time. Things had been rationed uh, and, and limited in ways that you know, we haven't had to deal with. And many of them had suffered dire economic consequences to their own incomes and their own businesses. And this was a massive sacrifice that, that people across this country made in a uniform kind of way across the whole population. And then Marshall comes back and says, okay, so we're going to sacrifice a little more to rebuild those countries that we just fought against. And maybe took the life of one of your loved ones. And it was not received with joy. It was a battle. And at the time, there were a lot of people who spoke very uh, darkly about George Marshall and his plan. And yet, in doing that, as those economies were rebuilt and the United States established relationships with them, it created the stop that Marshall had wanted to the expansion of Russia's control. But beyond that, it built relationships and alliances that to this day we benefit from. Uh, it created the trading partners we have in Japan and in Germany who for many, many years were our largest trading partners. It created ties that held us together and that helped prevent another world war of that scale from occurring. Now, I don't think Marshall went at that with a, oh, I've got to love my enemies mindset. I don't think he was more calculating than that. But nonetheless, what it demonstrated was, you know, your enemies, if you reach out to your enemies and you build these bridges with them, you might find that there's something good about them. You might decide that these people really can be your friends and that they're folks you want to be in relationship with. It went beyond really what Marshall envisioned to establish a whole different culture among those countries and a whole different relationship. On the flip side of that, there's another story I want to tell you this morning about how, how releasing that changes who we are and how we live. Um, I've told you before, my, uh, my father-in-law, Colonel Jack Rogers, John Rogers, uh, was captured when the Dutch surrendered Java in March 1942 and served uh, 
as a medic, he was a, a medic corpsman with what's become known as the Lost Battalion. So he served 42 months, three and a half years, as a Japanese POW. Through that time, uh, he was the one that cared for the men in that unit as they engaged in forced labor in Southeast Asia and later in Japan. And as they were basically starved, uh, they were fed a diet primarily of boiled rice. And as they were beaten, uh, when the doctor in the unit died, he became the head corpsman, the head medic for the unit. And roughly two-thirds of the unit died before they came back to the States. And he was the one that was with them when they were ill and when they were dying. It wasn't until the last few years of his life that he actually would talk about that experience with us. But it was interesting to hear him speak about the way that they cared for people in that time and the way they ministered to him in that time. The way that they would take apart the radio at night and hide it in different places so the Japanese would, would never know that they had a whole radio that worked. The way that they would hide their prayer books so that they would have them to pray with the men who were ill or who were dying. This is one that traveled with him. When they came back at the end of the war and were repatriated back to the United States, at a little over six foot tall, he weighed 96 pounds, spent six months in Walter Reed in rehab, and then picked up his life and went on. Went to UT, got his degree from UT. Yeah, there's my UT people. Went to UT, got his degree, met my mother-in-law there, got married, began his family and his career, and lived out his life. All of the men, of the, of the men that returned from that lost battalion, all of them came back with PTSD. Many of them came back with a bitterness and a hatred that separated them from God and separated them from the people around them. And it ate them up from the inside. It destroyed their physical health. It destroyed their emotional health. It caused grave damage through their lives. Many of them died very quickly after returning. And the interesting thing is, while so many of them found that that, that experience pushed them away from the people they loved and pushed them away from God, Jack actually found himself drawn deeper into that relationship with God. He and his wife helped establish the Episcopal Church that's in Wincrest, San Antonio, and they were those that started it up, started their families. Uh, to his dying day, he felt Toyota built the best car on the face of the earth. <laughs> he bore no ill will against the Japanese people or the nation. And, and when a, a contingent of them came over uh, uh, early in my acquaintance with him and, and came to Fort Sam uh, kind of as a part of the process of healing and recovering from that, he was part of the group that got to meet with them, showed them around the place. Uh, loved Asian food. Many of them, when they came home, would not eat any kind of Asian food. He loved Asian food, and his, he really enjoyed taking me to Asian food places and ordering the hottest thing on the menu and then watching me while I cried from eating it. But somehow he released that. He released all of that. And in doing so, he freed himself from that and was able to live his life to the fullest. I, I don't know that he was thinking about those words of Jesus particularly when he lived his life. But, but he lived them out. And that made all the difference. Not, not only for everyone else, but for himself. So I want you to hear when Jesus teaches, there's something about this that is life-giving to those who we think of as our enemies or our adversaries, but also to us. There's something life-giving in this. You've heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy, but I say to you, Love your enemies. Pray for those who persecute you so that you may be children of your Father in heaven. 
so that you may be children of your Father in heaven and be blessed in that way. For he makes his sun rise on the evil and on the good and sends rain on the righteous and on the unrighteous. For if you love those who love you, what reward do you have? Do not even the tax collectors do the same? And if you greet only your brothers and sisters, what more are you doing than others? Do not even the Gentiles do the same? Be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. To be claimed and to step into that role as children of God is to hear this word from our teacher and our master. And I want to remind you, uh, early in the summer, this word from a... N.T. Wright that I shared with you talking about the pandemic. He said, put Jesus in the center of the picture and work out from there. We don't start thinking and responding via the frame of anything else, political parties, political theories, theological action groups, or even extra biblical theological constructs and schemes, and then try to fit Jesus and the kingdom into those frames. It distorts, pollutes, and marginalizes Jesus every time. Put Jesus at the center and work out from there. My friends, we are in the midst of a really challenging time in our lives and in the lives of our community and our country. But as Jody said, maybe we're called to be the air freshener. Maybe we're called to bring the sweet scent of heaven into the midst of the world we live in. Put Jesus at the center. Put Jesus at the center and work out from there. Let's pray. Almighty God, we come and we confess to you that we are living in a difficult time. Uh, the whole year has been crazy. Uh, the pandemic and the racial tensions and the election and everything else. And, and sometimes we are overwhelmed and it is so easy for us to become angry and bitter in the midst of this. So come and, and let your love fill us that we might love as you love. That we might truly be your children in the midst of this. Let us be uh, the ones who bring the sweet perfume and heavenly scent of your love and your grace into the midst of this crazy world that we are in. We ask in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. My brothers and sisters, I'm going to invite you to stand with me and we are going to invite God to build his kingdom here. Come set your rule and reign in our hearts again. Increase in us, we pray, unveil why we're made. Come set our hearts ablaze with hope like wildfire in our very souls. Holy Spirit, come and make us now. We your church we need your power in us we seek your kingdom first we hunger and we thirst refuse to waste our lives for your our joy and pride to see the captive hearts release the hurt the sick the poor at peace Church, we pray revive this earth. Church, we are the hope on.
with you guys it's fun yeah yeah so I'm going to remind you a couple things uh when reminded you at the beginning of the service about the uh thanksgiving bags uh, i think most of them out there are this color now but there may be a few red ones uh we want, would like to reach 200 families so we need your help to do that and also on the website when you go on there there's a place to sign up to do deliveries so if you would do that as well and sign up we'll need help delivering these out as well as filling them uh, and that would be a really good thing. Uh, if you've never done that before, it, it really is fun. There's really not much more fun than taking food to people. I mean, you know, I'm sorry, especially when it's Thanksgiving. Also, I want to remind you, if you uh, have not gotten your estimate of giving in, uh, we know some of these did not make it in the mail. Uh, you're letting us know that. Uh, but you are uh, able to go online to the church's website. And uh, you go to the web, you hit the giving button at the top, takes you to the page for this. You hit the electronic estimate of giving. And then the, the page comes up that you can fill out, or you can print that page out and, uh, and bring that down and turn it to the office or mail it to the office. Either way, uh, whatever works best for you. And also, as you go out this week, you know, we're, we're not quite done with all this yet. There's still some wrangling going on. So I'm just going to remind you, there's this verse that the Spirit gave me the other week, and I want you to stand on it with me as we move through the rest of this from Ephesians 4, 29. Do we have it, Frank? There it is. Let no evil talk come out of your mouths, but only what is useful for building up as there's need. There's lots of need. So that your words may give grace to those who hear. So as you go out to speak grace into the lives of those around you, may the love of God, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the fellowship of God's Holy Spirit go with you. Amen. Shalom to you now. Shalom, my friend. May God's full mercy bless you, my friend. In all your living and through your loving, Christ be your shalom. 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 Shalom, shalom. Christ be your shalom. 